So let me see if I can get the technology working up here. Um, and thanks to everyone for making it back from lunch. And oops, we'll do, this is fine, this is right. It's good. Yep. <clears throat> and um, for coming to listen to me instead of my colleague Justin Courcell, who gives a way better talk than I do um, <laughs> over in the parallel session right now. Uh, I'm going to <clears throat> basically talk about three quick stories about what we do in my lab. Uh, each of these could fill up an hour's worth of seminar, so I just decided fine, I'll you know, cut them down completely. Unfortunately, I can't claim credit for this title. Um, Viruses from Hell is actually a title that a journalist came up with. Um, this is a picture of me and a couple of undergraduate students in Lassen Volcanic National Park about a mile and a half away from a place called Bumpus Hell. The reason it's called Bumpus Hell is a certain Mr. Bumpus in the late 1800s was taking a tour around this particular thermal area, fell through the snow into the hot spring and lost both of his legs. So that's the reason why we're looking at virus from hell. Um, this particular picture actually um, looks a lot scarier than it really is um, due to the miracle of wide angle lenses. So what am I going to talk about today? Basically, again, three stories. Um, first about SSV1, which is really the bread and butter virus that we work with in my lab. Um, talk a little bit about some of the genomics, genetics, and structures. And again, this could be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, talk a little bit about some metagenomics projects that we've been doing, um, particularly the discovery of what I think is a really unprecedented virus genome, which we originally called the RNA-DNA hybrid virus, probably chimeric virus is a better way of putting that, and then um, zombie viruses from hell, that's the other title for my talk, which I'll talk about right at the end, which hopefully will lead nicely into Dr. Nelson's talk about vaccines, um, because we think we may have found something that could be extremely useful in terms of vaccine discovery. Um, to keep track of where we are, I've basically put up three icons here, so if you happen to fall asleep in the next half hour, this is the first section, this is the second section, this is the third section. So why viruses from hell? Why did I get interested in the first place um, in studying these bizarre things? Um, basically, I was interested in archaea. Um, I just learned about archaea back in the you know, late dark ages when I was in graduate school and um, thought they were really fascinating organisms, but there was very little in the way of ways to study them. I did my PhD in bacterial transcriptional regulation. There was these amazing genetic tools, amazing biochemical tools. We didn't have those in archaea at the time, and this was in the late 1990s. Why archaea? Uh, everything I'd learned in my biochemistry and molecular biology courses say if you put your protein or your nucleic acid in boiling acid, they don't function anymore. But this is where many of these extremophile archaea happen to thrive. So our question was, you know, how can we or more in my case, how could I get into studying some of these things? It also turns out, in an evolutionary point of view, they're really similar to a lot of the basal eukaryotes, and particularly in the system I was interested in, which was transcription. Turns out the transcription machinery is extremely similar between archaea and eukaryotes. For little orientation here, it's the sub, large, sorry, small subunit 16S tree of life. Here's Sulfolobus, our main organism, and then all animals are over here. Why Sulfolobus? Uh, basically because it's really easy to work with. Um, basically, you take your LB media, you pH it to three with sulfuric acid, and heat it up to 80 degrees, they grow like crazy. Um, so really easy to work with, the heterotrophic aerobes, the genome sequenced, and of course, we didn't have viruses, I wouldn't be talking to you about them today. What do the environments look like where you find these things? Um, this is a volcanic hot spring in Lassen Volcanic National Park. Um, turns out this particular one is a little too hot for Sulfolobus. It's about 93 degrees Celsius on that particular day, and the pH is 1. But very similar kinds of conditions to where you find normal Sulfolobus growth, other than the conditions which we have in my lab. This is our artificial hot spring at Portland State University. Um, we grow our sulfolobus in these long neck flasks. Basically, you evaporate. It will then condense, falls back in, um, works extremely well. Um, how do we collect these samples? Basically, we go out to volcanic hot springs wherever we can find them. Temperatures above 70 degrees C, pH below 4. We take a sample. We bring it back to the lab. 
We put it in artificial hot springs, grow enrichment cultures, we do halo assays, we look for extracellular nucleic acid, um, and then under the transmission electron microscope. How do we collect these samples? Um, with a really long pole, um, because um, that is in fact the hot spring at the bottom there I just showed you the picture of, 90 degrees C, um, pH of about one and a half. A lot of people ask me, am I worried about the viruses I work with? No. I'm worried about the environment that they thrive in. I don't want to fall into one of these things. So this is sort of the background, but the real amazing thing that we found was when we looked in the electron microscope at what kinds of viruses we had in these environments. And this was just, to me, mind-blowing, and I think to many other people as well. The morphology of the virions that you find in these volcanic hot springs, and particularly things that infect things like sulfolobus and the other organisms that are closely related to them, don't look like any other kind of virion anybody had ever seen before. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about these lemon-shaped particles over here, so we won't talk about them now. David Prangishvili and his group at the Institut Pasteur in Paris have done some amazing work in the last couple of years discovering all these completely novel morphologies of virions. Cidionis bottle-shaped virus here. There's a Cidionis two-tailed virus that literally undergoes a morphological change outside the host cell where it grows these tails, which are absolutely critical for infection process to take place. The Cidionis filamentous virus up here it's about twice as long as the cells that it actually infects and has these nano-sized claws here which seem to be interacting with pili as the receptor interactions for the virus. How these things work is a really huge and open question. And we're only really scratching the surface, I think, in the terms of number of viruses that we're looking at here. Um, this is, in fact, the only virus of these extremophiles that looks at all like any of the other viruses that have been found before. It's, in fact, a virus that I found when I was working in Yellowstone National Park. Um, we call Sulfolobus turdid icosahedral virus. For those of you aficionados out there, it's a T equals 31 pseudo-equivalent icosahedral structure. Um, but I, unfortunately, don't have time to talk about that today. What I'm going to talk about are these fuzeloviruses, these are the lemon-shaped particles. Why? Again, it's kind of like sulfolobus. We study them because they're everywhere. Pretty much any one of those volcanic hot springs you go to, if you can find sulfolobus there, you'll find these viruses either present extracellularly as individual virions. One of these down here is an individual virion. Um, or integrated into the host genome. Pretty much all sulfolobus isolates have these integrated as well. And that tells you there's an integration event which happens. There's a viral integrase gene that I'll talk about in just a second. Um, one of the reasons I got so excited about this is because they've got circular, relatively small, double-stranded DNA genomes, and that's why I was interested in the virus in the first place. I wanted to set up genetic tools. And it turns out these are really useful and easy genomes to work with. But the first question, of course, is what's in the genome? About 15 and a half thousand base pairs, again, double-stranded circular DNA. What do you do when you do the sequencing? This was sequencing that was done by Peter Palm in the Zillig lab before I joined the lab in the 1990s. You take all of your sequences, you compare them to the databases with BLAST, and of the 34, 35 open reading frames, depending on how you count them, one, and only one, matched anything in the databases at that time. Turns out it was the viral integrase gene. And in fact, they already knew at the time that the viruses were integrating pretty well. Wolf Dieter Reiter, also a graduate student in Wolfram Zillig's lab at the time, had isolated virions and found the products of these three proteins here, VP1, VP3, and VP2, which were the main virus proteins. Everything else at that point, we had absolutely no clue what it was doing. And to make three years of my postdoc very short, um, and some more work done by graduate students for about five years. We were able to find out that a few of the genes in the genome, particularly these ones down here, the green ones were actually non-essential for virus function, and the red ones here were in fact essential for virus function. But this took a long time. Again, three years of my postdoc. Maybe I wasn't the most efficient postdoc. Um, but three years of postdoc, five years of graduate school, we said, okay, maybe it'd be a faster way to figure out which of these genes are important and which ones are not. So we took advantage of evolution and said, okay, well, I told you before, you find these viruses pretty well anywhere you find sulfolobus. Let's just let the environment tell us what works. Let's do comparative genomics. So we collect viruses from different parts of the world. This is the fun part of working in my lab, poking around hot springs and collecting things. That's exactly what we were doing in Lassen when I showed you those pictures there. 
and then sequence the genomes, find conserved genes, those are likely to be important for virus function, the non-conserved genes are less likely to be important for function and are probably telling you something about maybe the individual hosts that you happen to have in any environment or not. So we did this, this is a comparison of 10 different genomes right here and hopefully it's pretty striking, about half the genome is really well conserved, the other half of the genome is not conserved. And fortunately this compares really well to the data that I showed you before that I had gotten and my first PhD student had gotten showing which genes are important for function and which are not. Those that are important for function are well conserved, those that are not important for function are not that well conserved. So it's a nice correlation between the two here. There are a couple of interesting things. Um, one of them is one of the viral proteins is actually really poorly conserved. This VP2 up here, um, turns out we can knock this gene out specifically and the virus still functions perfectly happily. And we can even take this integrase gene and knock it out and the virus seems to be perfectly happy. So we've got some interesting questions that we don't know that much more about. But <clears throat> that leads me to some of the other things that we've been doing in the lab more recently and that is both random mutagenesis and site directed mutagenesis in the virus genome. This is basically all of Eric Iverson's PhD thesis in one slide, which is really probably not quite fair. Um, but all of the large open reading frames here that I've colored either gray, red, or green are those open reading frames that he's knocked out with site specific mutagenesis and all the arrows around the outside are random transposon insertional mutants, which even Eric, though he works really hard, hasn't had a chance to characterize all of. So we've had some undergraduates um, both working in my lab but also in one of the teaching labs that we have at Portland State University. Um, we actually give them mutants and say, hey, tell us where they are and how do they work. So that's the genetics, genomics aspect of SSV1. Been doing a collaboration with Mark Murray's lab at the UT Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. They've got really nice cryo-electron microscopes and they know how to deal with really funky looking structures. And so this is the cryo-electron reconstruction. At this point, um, from only about 900 particles, turns out it's a real pain to make very much of this virus. Um, and it has this really amazing sort of Nerf football shape, I call it, um, with probably most importantly this tail structure at one end. Um, it's only when you separate this tail structure from all the other particles this is the only part that has six-fold symmetry. And it turns out that six-fold symmetry and those six sort of projecting tails match exactly to the surface structure on the outside of the host, which we think is where the receptors are. And those are some ongoing experiments that we're looking at there. And that brings me to the fact that the editors of this journal thought it was so cool they put it on the cover, but who reads the covers of journals anymore? Unless it's like, you know, science or nature, you actually see it. So I have to throw it up there. It's so our, our cover picture. However, what's more important, at least for the rest of the talk, is what's going on in the background. Um, this background here is actually one of our favorite sampling areas in Lassen Volcanic National Park. It's a place called Boiling Springs Lake. It's probably the largest hot spring in the world that nobody has ever heard of. Um, the conditions in this lake, the low temperature, as far as we can tell, is about 52 to 53 degrees Celsius year round. High temperatures 95, 96 degrees, which at that altitude, about 6,000 feet, is boiling. The pH is two. So it's a pretty extreme environment, but it's also a lake. It's about 100 meters by 200 meters. And at the very far end here, the uh, resolution here is not great. Um, these are a couple of our botanist colleagues at Portland State University. So it gives you a bit of an idea of the scale um, here. None of my students wanted to go out on the lake and collect samples, so we had to have the mechanical engineering department design this little remote controlled boat to go out on the lake and collect samples. This is a collaborative work that's been done with groups at Humboldt State University and Chico State University in California. Our collaborators are mostly looking at the archaea bacteria and the few eukaryotes that can actually just barely squeak by under these kinds of high temperature, low pH conditions, um, we of course were looking at the viruses. Um, we tried to find lemon shaped viruses, completely unsuccessfully, um, probably because we're actually looking for the wrong hosts that we're using for screening in the lab. We know that a little bit later, but we had the opportunity due to some funding from the Moore Foundation to do some metagenomics. And just as a quick overview of metagenomics here, this is a viral metagenomics project. We basically got things that were the right size, i.e. got rid of all the bacteria and then concentrated what we had left, extracted the nucleic acid, amplified it, 
sequenced it, assembled the contigs, and then compared it to what was present in the databases. The red arrows on here represent the hard things. Um, is actually getting enough of your nucleic acid. We tried really hard to get RNA. We were never able to do so. We were only able to get DNA. And what do these things actually compare to? The other issue, again, with you know, getting enough DNA and RNA is you need enough material. So these are two of the graduate students who are working on this project. Eric Iverson, we basically you know, hired to come down and carry this stuff. His project, again, was all of the SSV mutagenesis. And Jeff Diemer in the back here, whose project was this metagenome project. So we got about 400,000 sequences. We used the 454 technology. Now, of course, that's old news, but that's what we had at the time. We took those sequences, we compared them to what was in the database, and we found about 2,000 of the reads of our 400,000 that matched anything, which at first is really disappointing as of what the heck do you work with these things. But Jeff was actually pretty happy because he figured he actually could work on these himself as opposed to um, not be able to work on much of anything. This is an overview of those hits, what we found. Not terribly surprising, we found a number of sequences that looked like archaeal, double-stranded DNA viruses, and in fact a couple of sequences that looked like they were pretty similar to some of our lemon-shaped virus particles that we'd had before. But those of you who are up front or reading very quickly, notice this thing down here at the bottom. I told you before, we tried really hard to get RNA, virus, RNA out of this system. We found absolutely none whatsoever. So it was extremely surprising when we were looking at the sequences and comparing them to databases, we had all these DNA sequences whose best matches were to RNA viruses. And I told Jeff, hey, you now check your stuff. You know, what's wrong with this? There's some clearly an issue here. And eventually he convinced me that actually, no, this was not a mistake. It turns out that there are sequences similar to RNA viruses. I won't show you the phylogeny. You've probably seen too many trees already. But are clearly in RNA-only viruses from the Tombus virus um, family of plant viruses. But at the same time, these are present on the same piece of DNA as a circovirus. This is a single-stranded DNA virus-like replication initiation protein. So it's a hybrid genome. It looks as if the progeny of RNA viruses and DNA viruses have somehow come together in one genome and been able to be maintained under this situation. Um, we published this um, a couple of years ago in Biology Direct, and then I was at a meeting where we got the Biomed Central Research Prize for this paper, where the editor of Cell said, oh, you should have sent the paper to us. Yeah, well, we sent it to another journal which rejected it. So. We won't get into that in any more detail. One of the big questions we had was, OK, is it just in this bizarre high altitude, low temperature, no, say low pH, high temperature lake? Um, turns out that people had found things like this years before, um, in, published in a certain journal with high citation index that starts with S, um, was a metagenome paper from viruses they found in Antarctic Lake, supplemental table eight, RNA viruses. That was the only mention in the whole paper. Turns out they're almost identical to what we'd found before. So publication in the journal Virology that came out just before our paper did, um, actually submitted just before ours came out, um, where they did this amazing study of Korean air samples. So they collected 50,000 liters of air, concentrated it down, sequenced the viruses which are there, found clearly similar sequences to what we found, and grayed them out in the figure of their paper, and basically said, we don't believe these data. Uh, in the meantime, we've done some metagenome searches that haven't been published yet. My favorite is a metagenome from deep sea sediments just off the coast of Greenland. 5,000 meters down, 4 degrees C, lots of similar kinds of sequences. Okay, 2,000 meters is what we find in Lassen, 5,000 meters below the surface, 4 degrees C to 50 degrees C. These things seem to be really pretty prevalent all over the place. Um, and my favorite sampling location that I need to get a grant to go to is in the Massif Central in France where there's a extinct volcanic lake that in the metagenomes there are lots of sequences there that you can find. So the big question is how did this happen? How do we have what looks like a fusion or a chimera between RNA and DNA viruses? So what seems to have happened, and a lot of this is hand waving right now, is that we have recombination that happened between a co-infecting RNA virus and, sorry, RNA virus and a DNA virus and a black box, and somehow this hybrid or chimeric virus came out. 
I have some ideas on how I think this happened, most of them having to do with how single-stranded DNA viruses replicate. How many of you know about single-stranded DNA virus replication? Okay, I'll give you a little review. Um, so <clears throat> what I think happened is, again, that somehow this single-stranded DNA virus that a rep protein, its own capsid protein, stole the capsid protein gene from an RNA virus. Reverse transcription took place and deletion of one of those open reading frames. But how could this be happening? I, mean, I think this has to do with how single-stranded DNA viruses replicate. First thing that happens, of course, is we have infection. Your single-stranded DNA is released inside the cell. Second strand synthesis takes place with the cellular DNA polymerase. Once you have double-stranded DNA, now, of course, you can make RNA to make all of the proteins, et cetera. One of those is the virus replication initiation protein, which is, I think, a really bad name. Rep is actually, it's an initiation protein. It's really more of a helicase recombinase than it is a polymerase. What does it do? It binds to this very specific structure here in the DNA, nicks the DNA, and in that process, hooks the five prime end to a tyrosine, which is conserved in the rep protein, and the three prime end is now available for cellular polymerase to replicate its way around the genome. You get to the end, it reverses its activity, you end up with a single-stranded piece that gets packaged, and this whole process goes around again. That gives us single-stranded DNA virus replication, single-stranded to double-stranded, and then the so-called rolling circle replication that takes place after that. So where does the RNA come in? Certainly, how does cellular DNA replication happen? RNA primers. So certainly it's a possibility. We had a messenger RNA that served as a primer for that original formation of the second strand. Or what I think is more likely is that rep, that recombination protein, has some activity on RNA as well as it does on DNA. And this, these are experiments which we're doing right now to see if that's in fact the case. So we could be using just the RNA as a primer. We could be hooking up the RNA to the rep protein. The rep protein could be ligating that RNA at the final end of replication. And so as I mentioned, we actually are undergoing experiments right now to test these hypotheses. Um, because I know the editor of the Journal of Evolution reasonably well, one of my colleagues, uh, Niles Lehman in the chemistry department, he let me get away with the title of this particular journal article um, down here as well. That brings me to the last part of my talk, which is the zombie viruses. And I can't claim credit for zombie viruses. That was actually Jim Laidler here um, who came up with that idea. Um, Jim's a really classic, I think, PSU student, showed up in my virology class, asks really, really good questions, most of which I don't know the answer to and then shows up in my office one day and says, oh, by the way, I'm an anesthesiologist. My midlife crisis is going back to school. Can I do a PhD with you? <laughs> anesthesiologist, my lab, I'm out in these volcanic hot springs. You should see his medical kit. His first aid kit's insane. Um, so yes, please, come work in my lab. And he actually just literally just finished his PhD. Um, the thesis was approved a couple of weeks ago. So I said, Jim, what do you want to work on? And he said, you're talking about virus fossils. This sounds really cool. Maybe we can find some virus fossils. And so Jim said, OK, well, let's try and see if we can do that. Where are we going to find virus fossils? Well, it turns out we'll find them in these volcanic hot springs. And the reason for that is that the silica, which is being leached out of the ground at very high temperatures at depth, once it gets to the surface and cools down, it's going to precipitate. So any kind of minerals, if you think about mammoth hot springs in Yellowstone, these things are growing like mad. And so if you're going to be encasing viruses in mineral, you're going to find it in some of these hot springs. So this picture here is, in fact, from a hot spring just outside of uh, Lassen Volcanic National Park called the Growler Hot Spring. And you can see, hopefully, um, on the side here that we have all these concretions, which is where viruses, hopefully, are being mineralized. But Jim was smart, and he said, well, we're not going to try doing this with viruses in hot springs because they're really hard to find. So let's start with a nice controlled condition in the lab where we can see if we can get sort of this first step. Can we get a silica coating under simulated conditions of what we think is going to be going on there? And lo and behold, you saw this. Up on the top of the slide here are our silica-treated bacteriophage T4, because you can get tons of it. It's got this beautiful morphology. And down at the bottom, 
is an untreated bacteriophage T4. So we can clearly get silica coating. We published this. You can see that the silica coating is right there. Unfortunately for Jim's thesis, um, if you left these T4 under those conditions for any longer than about two or three days, it became blobs, completely undetectable under the electron microscope. So Jim wanted to get a degree and uh, was thinking about, well, what else is going on? When you get silica coating, we know in the hot springs you're getting silica coating. What happens to a virus once it gets silica coating? And not terribly surprisingly, what he showed was that particularly taste of T4 now here in the blue line loses about four orders of magnitude of infectivity. This is a log scale on this side here. Turns out that vaccinia virus loses even more infectivity, even more rapidly. Some of our hot spring viruses, which is what we'd expect, lose less infectivity because they are probably more resistant to being solicified. They've been selected for this. Curiously enough, some viruses don't seem to get solicified at all. But the really cool thing that Jim found about this is that kind of a serendipitous experiment, i.e. being lazy and not diluting his samples too quickly, is that this inactivation is actually reversible. And it's reversible. First he showed this for bacteriophage T4, but also for vaccinia virus and any of those that we can inactivate by having a silica coating around the outside. Um, so this is why Jim called them the zombie viruses. We can kill them by coating them in silica, but then they come back to life again. So this was what I thought was really kind of cool. But then Jim said, well, what happens now to the viruses they are coating in silica? Do they have some kind of special characteristics that they otherwise wouldn't have? And it turns out that in the one that we've done the best studies on, which is bacteriophage T4, it's now resistant to drying for up to two months, whereas uncoated is not resistant whatsoever to drying. And so now what we're hoping to do is take what we've learned in this case and apply it to other viruses, particularly some vaccine strains and maybe even something like CMV, which you're going to hear about in just a couple of minutes, um, and see what this does. And our hope is that this coating will actually protect these vaccines from excursions from the cold chain. And now the cold chain, probably most of you know, most vaccines have to be kept at fridge temperature for pretty much the whole time between them being produced and actually getting out and being delivered in the field. Uh, this is great in a well-functioning first world country, but a lot of the places you need vaccines are in the developing world. And we think that this silica coating may be able to stabilize some of these viruses, certainly looking at water content, to extremes of temperature. So we could actually put these silica coated vaccines on the back of a donkey and not have to worry about cooling them down for long periods of time. Full disclosure here, um, Jim and I have a patent on this and we started a company about three months ago to try and commercialize this. So what have I just told you about in the last half hour? SSV1 is amazingly tolerant to mutation. I'm really surprised at that. And quite what this tells us is still, I think, kind of up in the air. And so as all good geneticists, we want more mutants. And in fact, we've got the undergraduate lab working on them right now. Um, pretty unique structure. Um, we're hoping to get to higher resolution in future. RDHV, um, we found it. We found some of the diversity there. And I showed you a little bit about our zombie viruses. Where are we going next? Um, we need a lot higher resolution structure of these lemon-shaped particles in order to let us know how the individual proteins are fitting together. We've had a breakthrough literally in the last couple of months to get a lot of virus particles, so I think we're going to be able to get to a much higher resolution structure there. Um, there's a lot more that we need to do in this particular system, but we've got all these mutants. We can make a lot of virus, so I think we're poised to make a lot of progress there. For RDHV, We've got some genomes, but we certainly need a lot more of them. What's the structure? The big problem we have right now is we don't know what it infects, which is a really kind of embarrassing problem to have. We think it's some of the eukaryotes that are present in this extreme environment. There's some algae, there's some fungi, there's some amoeba, all of which we're working on together with our collaborators at Chico State to see if those are potential hosts. And we've got some newer technologies that we're trying to figure out in terms of working out <coughs> process is going on there. And of course, now we're trying to get some vaccines up and running there. The other thing that I'm doing, and some of you may have noticed the camera up in the back here, um, working on a film project. Um, fellow here on the far right-hand side um, 
recent graduate of PSU, um, Rod Pittman, is an independent film producer. Um, I got him really excited about viruses, and he said, we should make a movie. And I said, oh, that sounds like an interesting idea. Um, how are we going to go about doing this? He said, oh, it'll be great. It'll be no problem. We'll be done in you know, six months. Um, this was about four years ago now. Um, but we do have some actually pretty cool trailers. And so if you've got a couple of minutes, I'd like to run the trailer from the film. It's a um, four minute trailer now, um, Edge of Life. And uh, ignore the little bit at the end, please. <laughs> segment I call fry the PI because you have to be so close to the fire to get enough light it's really hot. <laughs> by the way. So much for 2012. Um, so <clears throat> with that, um, all that's left is I need to thank a couple of people, particularly Mark Beret for my collaboration with the structure, everybody in the Stedman lab, of course, um, Patty Searing, Mark Wilson, and Gordon Wolf, our collaborators on the Lassen Volcanic National Park Project, um, Sherry Cady and Keith Badgett. Um, Keith Badgett's up at the Providence Cancer Center in Portland, um, who've been our collaborators on the zombie vaccine project. 
Again, I mentioned Eric Iverson's work and Jeff Diemer's work here. Um, this hot spring here in Yellowstone National Park is not where TAC polymerase was isolated. It's about 100 meters further along, but this one's a lot prettier. So at that point, um, you can read what it says at the bottom here, and I'll take your questions. Jay. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is here so people can, can hear it. Yeah, is, is, is this RNA DNA virus at all related to the HEPA DNA viruses, um, which have partial RNAs that are packaged in their genome? Turns out that there's actually no similarity whatsoever there. And so the similarity that we see is in the campsite protein, which is most similar to plant Tombus virus like, and then the rep protein, which is clearly a single stranded DNA virus like. So there doesn't seem to be any similarity, at least sequence wise, that we can tell. The replication cycle, so that it doesn't seem to go through a reverse transcription as the HEPA DNA viruses do. It just seems to be replicating regularly with this um, DNA process. Although, again, it's just the genome right now, so we don't have the host. We can't do all of these full experiments. But as far as we know, it's going to be replicating just like circoviruses do. And one more question. About, uh, so you isolated nucleic acid, or they isolated nucleic acid from the atmosphere? Yes. So this other group isolated nucleic acid from the atmosphere, yes. Okay, so isolated it, was it free nucleic acid or was it associated with bacteria or other organisms that were floating? Okay, so you're asking about, this is the, the paper was in Journal of Virology, it's a Korean group. Um, if I remember correctly, and I, I'd have to go back and look at the paper to see here, but I'm pretty sure they got everything that was smaller than 0.2 microns, treated it with DNAs, and then did proteinase K to get rid of capsids. So they tried to get things the appropriate size that were encapsidated and resistant to proteinase case. So they should have been encapsidated viruses at that point. But again, there are you know, all kinds of issues that could go with that clearly. Yeah, up in the back. Um, if, if the viruses, uh, the lemon-shaped ones, stop functioning when they go through that cooling off period, why do we find the similar viruses in such hot and then such cold temperatures? So I guess... Um, Maybe I don't quite follow your question. So these SSVs, the, the lemon-shaped ones, um, at least the ones that are infecting sulfalobus, you only find them actively replicating at high temperatures. Um, but one of the big questions that immediately comes up is how do they get from one of these hot springs to another? Because they're really closely related to each other. I showed you that conservation. Some of these things are almost identical to each other, even though they're halfway around the world. And that was, in fact, one of the reasons that Jim did this drying out experiment for the silica-coated viruses because we're thinking this might be an explanation for how some of these things can get from one place to another. What happens in volcanic environments, they have a nasty tendency to go boom. Um, and if you happen to have silica-coated viruses, this is a possibility. Again, huge amounts of hand-waving here, but it's certainly an explanation for how you could get transit. Certainly much more likely in local areas, like in Yellowstone, where you find a lot of really similar virus particles, Probably these get aerosolized not by a volcanic eruption, but by geysers or something else like that. Other questions, comments, worries? Um, we'll be going to Lassen sometime this summer. So we're looking for something to do this summer vacation. Come collect some viruses with us. Cool. Well, if that's the case, why don't we uh, get Jay set up? <laughs>